Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is the third event that we have had for Women's History Month. We are partnering with the Women Leads as well as the Black Scranton Project. And we are just so excited that all of you have decided to join us. This event is being recorded and by joining, you give consent to be recorded. So thank you so much for coming. Let us get started. I want to thank the subcommittee, the Bold um, Employee Resource Group subcommittee, the Education Subcommittee for the work that ha they have done to get these programs on the docket for us to be able to talk about women's health. And we're doing a special one for uh, Bold, the Black Outreach Leadership Development Employee Resource Group and looking at Black women's health matters. And so we have invited a number of women to talk about that. And we're so glad that you're going to join us. My name is Dr. Vicki T. Sapp. I am the Director for Student Engagement, Diversity and Inclusion at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. And I am also one of two chairs for BOLD. My co-chair is Dr. Daryl McBride. He is an infectious disease doctor. He works out of Danville campus. And he also serves as our assistant dean for student affairs in the um, for Central Campus. So uh, we both do bold and we're excited about the work that we are doing to bring these topics to light, right? Want to send out a very special thank you to the bold executive board as well as the marketing team creating the website and the flyer and the work that they do. Just awesome. So thank you so much. And I like to put those out there early, <laughs> right? We also have a number of things lined up. Here are the events and we'll save that till last to give you a little bit more detail about them. Faith will do that for us today, but really wanna shine a light on the speakers that we have and the great topics. So go to the website, look at those and please join us if you haven't registered for those. So BOLD is our Black Outreach Leadership Development Employee Resource Group. And we do a number of things to shine light on the Black experience, not only within Geisinger and Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, but also in the local community. So we partner with different community organizations so that we could um, shine a light on the experiences of Black people in America, um, regionally, locally, as well as um, right in our community. It's very important for us to have that sense of belonging, sense of um, um, just being, right? And that community, right? To assist with recruitment and retention. So we do a number of things to not only assist with recruitment and intent, uh, retention of folks, but really providing some wraparound services so that we can have a sense of belonging. And so that's our main initiative. So we invite all individuals from African to descent to join us if you are interested. So that's African, African-American, African-Caribbean, Afro-Latinx, we are open to all of that. We also have a few allies on the committee too. We have some white allies that are interested in understanding and working with Africans in the diaspora. So we do have a number of white committee members and they have been very instrumental in assisting us with um, our initiatives and push pushing and moving um, the awareness of black people within the system forward. So we do have white members as well, just so people understand. And if you are interested in joining us, you are welcome to do that. Okay, just send me an email and we will add you to the list and let you know when the meetings take place because we know that even with the civil rights movement, we had white allies and we can't do this work ourselves. But as long as people understand that everything we do will be focused on black, African, in the diaspora. As long as you understand that, you are definitely welcome to join us. We also have additional um, employee resource groups. 
And yesterday at our vision board with the women lead, they mentioned all of the employee resource groups. So I wanted to do the same thing for all of our programs as well. And we understand that we will have different people join us. And so we wanna make sure that you understand that there are more employee resource groups that exist at Geisinger and you are welcome to join any of these. So take a picture of this page email the individuals who are listed. So we have the women lead, we have the G pride, we have the vet net, which is our military, and we have the gang, which is our accessibility employee resource group. Anyone in the system can join any of these groups, any of these groups. So please, if you have an interest and you want to join these groups, please do that. Also bold, we will begin to start programming across all. This month, we're working with the Women's Lead um, ERG. In June, we're gonna be working with, um, June and October, we're gonna be working with the G Pride. November, we're gonna be working with VetNet. And um, I think October is also Accessibility Awareness and we're gonna be working with GANG. So we are planning to collaborate with each of these ERGs because we believe that it's important and we believe that black people are represented in each of these when we talk about the intersectionality of our identities we find black people in each of these ERGs each of them and so we're going to be working with them and collaborating on events so you will see those coming out soon. We also have our mugs. These are our winners. First time announcing our winners and for the mugs. So congratulations to those individuals who have won. You will receive an email. We're giving out five mugs per event. Once you win, you can only win once. So I'm gonna put that um, link in the chat once uh, Dr. Norwood starts her speech. I'm gonna put the link in the chat. If you're interested in winning a mug, please, please register. So I, someone may have put it in there. If you did, thank you, but I'll put it in soon. But here are the different type of mugs that we have. We also have these mugs. You can actually, if you have a scanner on your, your smart device, your phone, you can actually scan this QR code and it'll give it to you, but I'll put it in there shortly. Um, but these are the four mugs that we have. Very, very excited about the mug giveaway. If you come to the event, you stay till the end, you get a mug. If you are, it's raffled off, five. Uh, we also have our Black Excellence in Medicine Untold Story Series. Very excited about this. And we're going to be highlighting Black women in medicine. And so yesterday, well, Monday, we featured Dr. Rebecca Davis Lee Crumpler. So we featured her. Today, we're going to feature Jane Cook Wright. Today, I'm trying to move some stuff around here, sorry. <laughs> and so when we talk about uh, uh, Dr. Wright, Dr. Wright Cook, Dr. Jane Cook Wright, better known as the woman who changed the landscape of oncology. She was born in New York, New York in 1919. Dr. Wright was a physician and cancer researcher who de devoted her professional career to the development of chemotherapy techniques. Dr. Wright attended a private school in New York City. In 1942, she graduated from Smith College with a Bachelor's of Arts degree. And three years later, Dr. Wright graduated from New York Medical College, earning her MD. In fact, Many of the men in her family held MD degrees, including her father, who was one of the first African-Americans -American, to earn an MD degree from Harvard. So we want to spotlight Dr. Wright for her contributions to medicine and say, these are some untold stories that we want you all to um, be informed about to look up on your own if you wanna know more about her. And that's what we're going to be doing this month is featuring these dynamic women in medicine. My name again is Vicki Sapp. I'm going to be introducing Dr. Norwood. Very excited about having Dr. Norwood speak for us today. 
So Dr. Norwood, her, ma her mantra is find solutions, not excuses. She is a graduate of W.E.B. Du Bois Maria Harvard Honors College of Jackson State University in the University of Iowa Medical School. She's a family medical physician with Henry Ford, family medicine physician with Henry Ford Health System. The, the service chief of family medicine for Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital, director of practice development and community health education an assistant clinical professor for Wayne State University School of Medicine. She is an ambassador for healthcare equity, Henry, what? Healthcare equity, Henry. Mm, I don't know what happened here, but that's okay. She was an inaugural president of the Organization of Physicians, Academians, and Executive Leader for Henry Ford Medical Group. Dr. Norwood has been named as Metro Detroit's Our Magazine's top doc annually since 2008 and received the Robert E. Brink Award for Excellence in Research. She currently serves as the president of Jackson State National Alumni Association Incorporated and believes in the education mentoring and investment into the bright minds and those who will chart the future global course of academic excellence in justice and in equity. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Norwood. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sapp, and good, good afternoon and good morning to those of you that may be on the on the, the on central time and, and even earlier for those who may be on Pacific time. It's a blessing to have this opportunity to talk with you this afternoon. I have a lot that I wanna share with you. So give me one moment, I'm going to share my screen so that we can talk about prevention. see if it can, I can, if it'll allow me to put this in present mode for you. We've had some challenges this, this, uh, this uh, afternoon with simply being able to get this document, hopefully. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, we yes. can see it. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about prevention for women and I wanna find a way to keep it simple. And I know there's, um, for all of you that are on this, on this, uh, this session, that there's so many different things that, that come at us in terms of the, the needs for healthcare and uh, the needs for family and the needs for work and the needs for, uh, if you're in ministry and social organizations. So I, I wanna give, give you a lot of data today and then at the end, I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna keep it simple with one simple message. I wanna make sure that these are advancing. Uh, Dr. Sapp, are the slides advancing? Can you see the next slide? Are you uh, able Dr. To Norwood, we're still on the prevention slide, the very first slide. Oh, so it is not allowing you to see the other, okay? Because I have actually advanced to my third slide, okay? And Dr. Norwood, I'm actually behind the scenes trying to see if I can pull it up differently and share it for you, because I know you okay. shared it with me. So okay. no, we're not um, seeing it. You don't see it advancing. It's um, advancing see now. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna keep it, um, I'll take it out of present mode. Um, are you able to see the full, the full screen? Hopefully yes, and so. we were not able to see it in present mode, but we can see it. So I'm going to have you go okay. ahead and I'm going to just Good. be behind the scenes trying to see okay. if I can do something different for you. So this is one of our hospitals, Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital, where our focus is all around wellness. And I think that's really important for us as, uh, as women. 
Um, I, this picture is a great depiction for me. You see the woman dressed half of her dresses in her work clothing and the other half is doing so many other things. And then I'm sure a lot of you very often feel like you are this woman doing multiple things with the limited resources, but 50 different hands doing 50 different things. So there are some things that make me go, hmm, you know, and just wondering what does some of this mean? Uh, that last bullet is something that my children would say that if you're over 50 that you don't have sex, so what matters? Um, so I, of course, I'm only 22, so I haven't, I don't, haven't had the chance to experience that yet, but um, I am positive that people over 50 have sex, so there are some issues here that we'll talk about as we talk about women's health. This is a general screen just to show you, I'm going to go through some basics, and um, you know, I think it's really important for women to make sure that you get your regular physical exams, that you have your pap smears done, and pap smears can now be done every three years. Uh, if you've had a history of normal pap smears, um, then we recommend starting those pap smears at age 21, that for young women up to the age of 26, the recommendation is to also do STD screening. Mammograms are recommended, uh, at least starting at age 50 and now more towards 40, uh, up to age 75, every, uh, every couple of years based upon your risk factors and checking your cholesterol roughly every five years. There's also recommendations around colon cancer screening, blood pressures being checked. Um, you know, I, I shared with the uh, group previously, hypertension is a silent killer, meaning you don't know your blood pressure is high unless you check it. So the only way that you know that your blood pressure is normal is to check it. So I'd admonish all of you to make sure that you check your blood pressures regularly so that you know what it is. And one other caveat, especially for women, uh, women of color and men of color, there's, um, there's some speculation that there may even be a gene that makes you more sensitive, that may make African-Americans more sensitive to salt, hence having a higher blood pressure reading when um, you have minimal salt in your diet. And the thought is that as little as half a teaspoon, half a teaspoon of salt could be impactful for the blood pressures going up. So be cognizant of that with, uh, with your diets and make sure that you check your blood pressures. And diabetes is also very important, checking your blood sugars and uh, the HPV testing. So the HPV vaccine did have some updated recommendations. It was recommended up to the age of 26, but now the recommendation is up to age 45. The flu shot is recommended every year. As most of you know, we've not had much flu this year, thanks to COVID and some of the, um, the seclusions and uh, washing your hands, some of the very same things we've done to decrease the risk of COVID, it's helped with the flu. So uh, thankfully we haven't had uh, much this year with uh, flu outbreaks, but the recommendation is to get the flu if you're six months old and older. Um, the pneumonia vaccine starting at age 65. There are populations where this, the, the pneumonia vaccine is recommended sooner. So if you're someone who has an increased risk, you wanna start the pneumonia vaccine sooner. So if you're 28 and you've developed um, diabetes, the recommendation is to start the pneumonia vaccine then and not to wait until you're 65. So for certain, certain conditions, cystic fibrosis, uh, sickle cell disease, um, if you have some of those conditions, COPD, if you have some of those medical conditions, you don't wait until you're 65, make sure that you get the pneumonia vaccine sooner. Checking an EKG, and there are certain uh, risk factors where the EKG is also recommended sooner. Bone density, at least at age 65. If you are um, glucose or uh, lactose intolerant, if you have if someone who've had multiple fractures, four or five, six fractures in your lifetime, you also don't need to wait until you're 65. Those are recommendations to begin sooner if you have increased risk. Of course, check your vision and your height and weight. I, I, um, I told uh, one of my uh, staff members this uh, last week, when we were talking about height, checking your height and weight, a lot of, a lot of um, and, I, and I say this to all of you, um, sometimes when you go in for your exams, um, the, the medical assistant may say, what is your height? And you say, I'm 5'1", and then they write that down for your height. 
I, I need for all of you to, to advocate for checking your height, not just allowing your height to be told because your height changes with time. And that's one indication of bone loss, bone loss, osteoporosis by not, by losing height. So if you're in for your physical exam or any exam and they just say, give me your height, where the height is really important, tell them, no, we, do you please check my height and not just use the number that you give them. That's important. Um, but I grow taller. Whenever I gain weight, I grow taller. So my BMI always stays below 25. <laughs> well, eating is an important thing, but sleep is also important. And I just want to share this slide again, because that, you know, if you don't need a lot of sleep, if you're a giraffe, but if you're a woman, you need sleep. If you are a man, you need sleep. And there are a lot of things, a lot of mammals who require different levels of sleep. But if you're not a giraffe, I need you to realize that when you limit the amount of sleep that you get, that you have lots of other cognitive and physiological issues that can occur from decreasing your work pro productivity to having mood swings to de increasing your blood pressure. And for women, it's also important to know that it increases insulin resistance, which is something that increases your risk of diabetes and weight gain. So if you want to lose weight, make sure you go to sleep. So I wanna share a little bit here on, in reference now to um, another disorder um, around cancers, because um, there's, um, um, and I wanna talk a, a bit about a few of the cancers that impact, uh, specifically that impact women's health, but just um, a, a little bit of definition about what cancer is. But any, it's a group of diseases in which cells grow out of control. And there are different types, but you'll hear a benign, malignant, and we also hear the term metas, um, metastatic, metastatic cancer, which means that the cancer has spread. But know that when we say benign, it means that it's not cancerous and malignant, typically that it is. There are different types of cancers as well. The ones that we know most frequently are those that go in the category of carcinomas. Breast cancer is a carcinoma because it involves a tissue, but there's also cancer of the blood, the bones or the lymph nodes, and those are different types of cancers. We've got different warning signs for things that you should look for and in general, if you have a lump or change in skin, if there is a sore that's not healing, if you're a horse all of a sudden and it's not going away, if there's a change in bowel habits, those are things for you to look for that may be an indication that something is something more serious is going on. But we know that there's um, a lot of risk factors for cancer. Genetics is one, but there is a whole lot more in terms of our environment that affects us for our risk for cancer. Smoking is one of the biggest. The record, it's thought that by 2030, most of the world, especially in third world countries, will have increased their risk because they became more modernized uh, like we were in the US for so many decades with smoking, that that's going to increase the risk. And not to mention the other things in terms of radiation exposure and the changes in our, uh, in our climate and the exposure to UV lighting, all of these. But we also know time is one of the big factors in increasing our risk of cancer. Well, women, we have multiple different uh, risk for us in terms of cancer. And I just want to start with the one that is one of the ones that's one of the most treatable and most curable, the, uh, the risk of cancer of the cervix. So we diagnose cancer of the cervix with a pap smear, right? So we talked about the um, pap smear being done roughly every three years. And because of the pap smear, we're finding a lot of cancers, cervical cancers sooner. There are things that increase your risk for getting cervical cancer, such as ethnicity and aging. And there's also things that you can do to decrease your risk that are controllable, not smoking, watch, watching what you eat, uh, limiting, not having multiple sex partners. Um, and in my household, multiple sex partners is anyone or other than me. So it's multiple. <laughs> Cervical cancer, pap smears should typically begin around the age of 21. Women who've had three pap, normal pap smears and, and um, they are at low risk can actually do the pap smears every three to five. And that five year period is when we actually do HPV typing as a part of the pap smear. 
And most women, if they're at low risk, can stop doing the pap smears at 65. But that's something you definitely want to discuss with your doctor. But we do know that we can decrease the risk with the HPV vaccine. So getting that vaccine is important, as well as all of the other preventive measures that you have control of, not smoking and watching what you eat. Well, we know that there have been different individuals such as uh, Joey Feek, uh, the author, Judy Bloom, um, Henrietta Lacks, who also had, is a cancer, um, who also had cervical cancer. Colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer. Um, and colorectal cancer, as you know, is, um, is something that has been in the news uh, a, a lot more frequently here. There are some risk factors as well that you can't control. If you're someone with any um, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, so it's inflammatory disorders of the colon, there's an increased risk of colon cancer, as well as having polyps and family members potentially with colon cancer. So the recommendation is if someone in your family had colon cancer, you wanna make sure that you do your colonoscopy or evaluation at least 10 years prior to that family member, especially if that family member was diagnosed um, in their 40s or earlier. So watching it's not smoking and again, the diet um, we uh, lost a, a, a great actor last year with Chadwick Boseman, who uh, died at a very young age and had been dealing with ca colon cancer for some years, receiving multiple forms of treatment. Um, and so this is an example of someone dying before the age of, of 50 and being diagnosed before the age of 50. There are lots of different ways that we can actually check for colon cancer, ladies and gentlemen, and the, the FIT test, uh, the these are ways without having a colonoscopy, the uh, checking for fecal occult blood, those are tests that are done every year, a flexible sigmoidoscopy, which goes partly around the colon, but not all the way around the colon, that can be done every five years. Cologuard is another one that can be done roughly every three. But what I want to, the, to hit home here is that one in seven people who are diagnosed with colon cancer will have it before the age of 50. So it is really important to make sure that you start early, 45 or sooner, if you have um, to have this start doing this screening for colon cancer. And there are multiple ways, again, multiple uh, different ways of doing that screening, including virtual colonoscopies. The gold standard is still considered though, the colonoscopy, which is done um, with the, um, where if there's a polyp or something that's found, it can be removed and biopsied. So that's the gold standard. Okay, and that's what the colon looks like. And again, here are some of the simple things you can do to reduce your risk of colon cancer, limiting alcohol, exercising regularly, having a high fiber diet so that you're not constipated. These are some other famous faces of uh, people who died from colon cancer. Um, the uh, uh, actress who, who also died from colon cancer well before the age of 50. And of course, the uh, famous RBG who also had uh, colon cancer. Well, this cancer is the deadliest. More people will die from lung cancer than they will from breast cancer, for instance, for us ladies. Even though more women will get breast cancer in their lifetime, more people will die from lung cancer. So the average age for, for the diagnosis is roughly around 60. Smoking is the biggest risk factor for, the, for lung cancer. And your exposure to, to smoke, to, to not only being a smoker, but the exposure to smoke. And this is where I think it's so important that firsthand, firsthand um, smoking is you smoking. Secondhand smoking is you're in the room and people are smoking around you, increasing your risk. Thirdhand smoke is where the fumes absorb into different things, the carpet, the bed linen, the clothing, and then you are around those items for extended periods, increasing your risk as well. So try to decrease your risk of first, second, and thirdhand smoke, which increases the risk of lung cancer. 
There are some other things that can also increase your risk, including in, from infections like pneumonia and, and air pollution. And then of course, the things that we can control our exposure to things like asbestos and smoking. But here's some good news. If you stop smoking at any age, you can actually reduce your risk. So even though you may have been a smoker for years, if you stop smoking, some studies show that in 10 years, it could be as if you never smoked. So make sure that you never feel hopeless. And the people who are most successful in stopping smoking are those who continue to try over and over again. So even if you've tried for five times to stop smoking, if you try and continuously try it, those are the individuals who tend to be most successful. Well, we've had quite a few uh, famous faces as well who've died from lung cancer and some very recently with Larry King and some of you may meet, know Dustin from Saved by the Bell. Of course, that silky voice of Nat King Cole who died from lung cancer as well, but that voice was also affected by lung cancer. And here's someone who didn't smoke. And I think this is a, a, the reason I wanted to include Dana Reeves the wife of Superman, if you can recall, Chris Reeves, but she wasn't a smoker. But she did have exposure in working in cabarets. So she had exposure to second and third hand smoke. And there are some cancers that can occur that are not related to smoking at all. So there are some cancers that are not necessarily uh, prevalent because of smoking. Well, the next cancer that I want to share a little bit with you on is skin cancer. There are different types of skin cancer as well. Basal cell carcinoma, which tends to be more common in Caucasians, and squamous cell carcinoma. Those don't tend to spread as much. Malignant melanoma, which can spread and, um, and tends to be one of those very uh, deadly skin cancers. And the rate has more than doubled in the past 30 years. And the reason this point is so important is because it's things that we can do that are preventable. There are things we can do that are preventable when it comes to skin cancer. So you're at increased risk. The fairer skinned you are, the more likely uh, you are to be, um, to be vulnerable to these ultraviolet waves. The more moles that you have, the increased aging, the more, of course, the longer you live, the more opportunity there is to develop skin cancer. And especially if you're someone who's been a sun worshiper and had multiple skin burns, you increase your risk with these skin burns from, um, from uh, tanning, tanning and going into and laying out on, the, on the, the beach where you're not using sunscreen. The recommendation is to use at least 30 um, SPV for sunscreen. And that's for everyone, for everyone, not just Caucasians and not just for the fair freckled individuals. Wearing sunscreen is important for everyone. So the control to ultraviolet light is something that we do have control over. And we've had some mighty men and women who've developed skin cancer uh, from uh, Wolverine to the actor from Beauty and the Beast, um, another personality with Bethany Frankel, and yes, African-American people get skin cancer too. Bob Marley had skin cancer. So we as African-Americans tend to think that this again is a disease that doesn't affect uh, people of color, but it affects people of color and um, underrepresented minorities as well. So these are the things that I need you to look for when it comes to skin cancer look for the ABCs, the ABCDEs of skin cancer, where something looks asymmetrical, where the border is irregular, the color is, is different. So something that has a solid brown color is less concerning than something that has, that's red, white, and blue, or has multiple colors in it. Something where the diameter is increasing. So a diameter of six millimeters, or like the size of a, pen, a pen, pen, eraser, head is something that is small enough that you could actually have, um, if, you, if it's that size or greater, it could increase your risk. And then something that's changing, evolving. So you look at this mole last month or two months ago, it looked really small and now it's, it's larger in size, it's changing. It's something that should be checked. So as I noted, this is not an illness or cancer that can just occurs in um, Caucasians, it occurs in 
different ethnicities can be seen in different ways. And you can see this is an example of what it can look like in the nails and when it can occur around the lips and the eyes. And in African-American skin, you can see here the uh, different ways that skin cancer can pre present itself. But I need you to know, especially for people of color, the more common locations for this skin cancer are hands and feet. So we always recommend for African-Americans to, to not just check those sun exposed areas, but make sure that you're checking your hands and your feet, where, which are very increased areas for skin cancer for people of color. Well, women uh, making up this US all over the world, making, uh, making a difference in our country, the number one cancer risk for us women is still breast cancer. It's, um, it's thankfully one of those cancers that, that we can survive because if it's found and diagnosed early, we can actually have 95% um, cure rates, 95 to over closer to 97% cure rates. And then, uh, and it really depends on how early it is found. So if the cancer is found where it's well localized, 97% 97% um, uh, survival rates. And the longer the, or the further it spreads from regional areas where it's in the 70s to uh, distant areas where it's uh, metastasized to a distant area, the survival rates can go down to the 20s, 20% 20 or so. And most of us could probably think of someone that we've had in our lives or in that we've had a relationship with that has been exposed or at risk with, um, with breast cancer. So from um, actresses, uh, anchors and hosts, you know, we've seen quite a few different individuals who have developed uh, breast cancer and it's very prevalent. And so here are some things that I want you to know in terms of the US statistics. Breast cancer is, uh, became the most common cancer globally in uh, 2021, accounting for about 12% of all new cancer cases worldwide, according to the World, World Health Organization. So it's projected that this year we'll have more breast cancer um, by the World Health Organization. And that could be due to multiple factors. And we'll, we'll talk about a few of those. But what I really want you to also understand that the younger you get breast cancer, those breast cancers tend to be more aggressive. So in women who are under 45, those cancers tend to be more aggressive cancers. And those are more common in women of color and African-American women. And black women are more likely to die from breast cancer. Again, especially since the more aggressive cancers can occur younger than age 45 in that ethnicity. And then we also have Jewish women who have this BRCA gene, which increases the risk and of breast cancer. So if you are a woman who has a family member with breast cancer, especially if it's a mother, sister, sister or daughter um, or brother, and I guess I should add or brother in this group, then you have an increased risk of breast cancer as well. But most women don't have a family member with breast cancer. Most women, 85% of the women who are diagnosed with breast cancer have no family connection at all. So that's the reason we all need to be checked. and We all need to um, do our mammograms consistently for evaluation of breast cancer. So when you think about the country, over 300 million people in the, the United States, almost uh, 160 million women, 40, over 43,000 women will potentially die this year from breast cancer. But Thankfully, we'll have over close to 4 million who are breast cancer survivors. But this is still a significant loss in our community with women with over 43,000 potentially dying from breast cancer. So breast cancer accounts for about 30% of all of the newly diagnosed cancers and the median age is around 60. And African-American women though, the, the median age is younger. It's around 68 and for Caucasian 62 but one in eight women will get breast cancer in their lifetime, one in eight women. That's significant because in the 1970s, it was one in 11. And I remember even when I was in um, doing my residency training, it was one in 10. So the numbers for 
the uh, number of women who have the increased risk has actually increased for us over time. So women, one in eight, think about that. If you're in a, in a circle with eight of, 10 of eight of your friends, one of you potentially in that group would develop breast cancer. So why, why are we seeing this increase? Because uh, there is an increase since the 70s. And one thought is that it may be related purely to the life expectancy that women are living longer. And so, of course, the longer we you live, the more likely things are that things can happen. The change in reproductive patterns, women are having children later as opposed to earlier. So a change in the reproductive pattern means a longer exposure to unopposed estrogen, which can increase your risk of, um, of breast cancer. Menop uh, menopausal hormone use. So there is some increased risk with the use of estrogen and um, some maybe with the low dose birth control pills if you're at really high risk. And of course, we carry estrogen as well. We carry estrogen as well with uh, obesity. So when you look at these areas, ladies, that we have for extra fat, those, ex those extra pounds that we're carrying with estrogen rich sources can increase our risk of breast cancer. So it's not just getting it from a pill, but that extra estrogen we're carrying in our bellies and our buttocks and our thighs. So that's another reason for us to be really cognizant about watching our weight. Now, COVID-19 has probably added 20 pounds to most of us on this, uh, on this call. So know that COVID-19, it's an infection, of course, which is really real for our communities in terms of the illnesses associated with COVID-19. But the weight gain that we're getting from sitting at computers for long periods of time, eating um, foods that just give us uh, some comfort at the moment, increases our weight and also increases our risk. Well, we've had some very uh, significant people again who have, who have died from or been affected by um, breast cancer. And all of these um, individuals, again, from different backgrounds, different ethnicities and uh, different stories. Uh, who would have ever thought little young Shirley Temple one day would grow up to be a woman who would be a breast cancer survivor? So here are some of the things that we don't control. Again, the longer we have unopposed estrogen, exposure to unopposed estrogen, there's an increased risk. So if you start your periods very early, before the age of 12, or end your periods very late, that's again a longer time period for estrogen, estrogen exposure, and that can increase your risk. Of course, the family history of uh, breast cancer, or if you've had a personal history of, of breast cancer, there's an increased risk that you could have a recurrent uh, breast cancer in the opposing breast. Um, and then of course, if you're someone who's having children well after the age of 30, again, we're talking about longer exposure time where your estrogen is unopposed or not interrupted, which can increase the risk. So those we don't control, but we can control again, the foods that we eat that are high in fat, the alcohol use, and the, the um, overweight and obesity and the use of hormonal therapy. Yeah, Diane Carroll was another breast cancer survivor. Shannon at Doty, another breast cancer survivor. Applegate, another breast cancer survivor. And I love that she can rock it with her hair I, she, because I am not my hair is what Melissa says. And another breast cancer survivor. Of course, Ruby D, the famous actress. So the hormonal effects of, um, of estrogen um, from birth control pills and hormones, we've talked about increasing your risk. There's been some recommendations from the US Pre Preventive um, Services Task Force that for us to tell women not to do breast exams, that um, doing breast exams could cause you to start feeling things that are not really significant and make you more anxious. Um, I am still of the uh, belief that women who do their breast exams tend to find things sooner. I have no problems with my patients doing their breast exams, feeling something that's not an issue and coming to see me for me to tell them that it's not. So um, I'm still an advocate of doing self breast exams. 
I, I believe that you, you need to be your own healthcare advocate. So, um, but one of the biggest and most important measures that we have for breast cancer in breast cancer evaluation is mammography. So women, please do your mammograms, do them regularly and in making sure that you do the follow-up to see those things as they're, as they're changing. So it's very helpful to be able to see what just two years ago, there was nothing there. And now we see something, we know that this is not something that's been there for an extended period of time, simply because of the regular checks. So here again are the, the recommendations for breast cancer screening, to make sure that you do examine your breast and consult with your doctor. And for many women, you can actually uh, stop doing mammograms at age 75 if, um, if you're at low risk, and that's something you should discuss with the doctor. So what can you do, again, to decrease your risk of breast cancer? Eating a low-fat diet, exercising, limiting your, your alcohol intake, making sure that you monitor your weight and do your regular screening, such as mammography. Women, it's this your body, and it's so important to make sure that you own it and that you do the things to, to take care of it. This is your body. You need to own it and to take care of it. These are some other breast cancer survivors. Many women that, uh, that we've known who've been affected by breast cancer. Yes. Even the best, one of the best comic reliefs with Wanda Sykes, also a breast cancer survivor. And um, um, I'm blocking on the name of the show that Roxy Roker was in with uh, George. What's the, the name of the show? Um, I'm moving on up uh, that uh, sitcom. Roxy Roker also um, a, uh, who, who died from breast cancer. But I also need you to know that men get breast cancer too. So we've talked about quite a few women who get it. So breast cancer isn't as common in men, but you, men can get it as well. So men, approximately 2,600 of them will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year. If you are a few men who have been diagnosed with breast, breast cancer, uh, Peter from KISS, uh, Shaft himself, Richard Roundtree, who's a breast cancer survivor and uh, Beyonce's dad, also a breast cancer survivor and Montel Williams, another breast cancer survivor. So here are just a few things to, to note in reference to the breast cancer. One in men, it's rare, 1% or less with uh, breast cancer. And a note for the, the risk hormonal use being one, the prognosis is usually good. Surgery is usually a part of the, the, um, the recommendations for men who get breast cancer, but my admonishment again to the health providers who are on this um, on this this call is to make sure that you do a breast exam in men as well, to make sure that you find those lumps. I've had uh, two men in my practice who've uh, who've had breast cancer. So for those cancers, there are multiple treatment options that are available, and this just gives you a few ideas of what they are. Um, Complementary uh, therapies for cancer is also helpful. And I just wanna stress that these are complementary services. I've had um, one young lady who came to see me with breast cancer. She was an African-American female in her thirties, heard her husband for the very first visit because she felt a lump. Um, and when she came in for that first visit, I felt the lump and much larger um, breast mass in her left breast with, um, contiguous lymph nodes that were also um, swollen and enlarged in her armpit. Um, so I told her we, there were a few different things that we needed to do to continue to work it up. Um, she decided she didn't want to do any of that work up because she'd seen something on the internet that breast cancer, this woman who was cured from breast cancer from using essential oils and um, with some of the complementary visionary uh, therapies to, and her cancer disappeared. So she and her husband opted to do that until she came back with a very large fumigating breast mass that was now opened from the skin and draining. And because it was open and draining and staled, horrific, 
that was what made her and her husband decide to come back that this complementary therapy wasn't working. So I wanna be really clear. These are complementary therapies, which means they are used in conjunction with therapies that are tried and true. Um, so I, I never recommend for someone who has a breast mass for you simply to do visual, visualization for that mass to go away. Um, please make sure that you consult with your doctor for the best treatment plan, which would be inclusive of complementary therapies. So again, for breast cancer, minimizing your risk, eating healthy, stopping smoking, talking to your health pro provider and having a plan that you actually do with your provider. And I think when we start looking at all of this, I've given you quite a bit, um, quite a bit today in, in reference to cancer. And I just want to now stop for one minute because when you think of all of the things that from the cancers that we've talked about to the preventive services from blood pressures, pap smears and immunizations that are needed, you know, it's a lot to absorb. So there's rarely time that we take a moment to just stop and think and do nothing. So I want everyone to please just close your eyes for one moment where I need just one minute of your time for you to do nothing. And I'm going to time it. So I ask for everyone to simply close your eyes for me for one minute. Give me one minute of you doing nothing. Thank you. Giving yourself just a minute during your day to do nothing but to refocus on you, to clear cobwebs, to clear irritants, people, situations, just time for you. I want you to, to find a moment in your day often to do just that, to give yourself a moment for just you. And be careful about the things that you say. You know, limit your always, that you're gonna always be there doing stuff for everybody. Limit your always statements. I also want you to limit your never statements, saying, I'll never do that. Be open, allow yourself to explore, to be adventurous, to find new avenues and new things that can re, re energize that 22 year old within you and that childlike love that's in your heart. Find times to, to do that. And I need you to realize that even those things that you find small and minute, things that you, you think are insignificant, that not only you matter, but the things that you do matter. So you're a blossoming flower ladies where you're continuing to open and blossom and to become that, that CEO or that mother or that educator or that, um, that minister, whatever it is that you have envisioned for yourself, whatever it is that you want to accomplish personally, make sure that you don't lose sight of who you are and what you want to be and what you want to accomplish. Make sure that you don't allow the agenda of others to overtake the agenda and purpose that God has given to you. 
Yeah, we come in different size, shapes and colors, but we are all Wonder Women. So you may not look like this one or that one, it doesn't matter because we all have value and we have worth and your most important mission is to live your true purpose and live it in authenticity. I love this quote by uh, my soror, uh, Coretta Scott King of uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, where she says, women, if the soul of the nation is to be saved, I believe that you must become his soul. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. I know I went a little quickly there through a uh, hundred plus slides to uh, give you a good summary of, of uh, women's health. But when we keep it simple, I, I hope you saw the theme that whether we're talking about preventive health with blood pressure, diabetes, preventing heart disease, or preventing all of these different types of cancers. There are some simple things you can do. Watch your diet, eat a healthy diet, avoid alcohol to, to excess, exercise regularly, lose weight, and do those preventive screenings so that you are aware. You don't wanna walk in darkness or ignorance. You walk in knowledge. So to avoid doing tests like the colonoscopy or to avoid doing tests like the mammogram, knowing that colon cancer is the third most common cancer in women, breast cancer being the most common cancer in women, to avoid your pap smears, which is another cancer that's one of the most curable cancers that we have. And now with the HPV vaccine, one of the ones that can actually decrease your risk of getting a cancer, there are things simply that you can do that will cover all of these different categories from cancer to heart disease, to blood pressure, to diabetes. So please start to implement some of these strategies and you will help yourself overall with all of those various illnesses. And most of all, again, remember to stop, give yourself a moment to think, to breathe and to recenter. So thank you. I, I will stop there, Dr. Sapp, and uh, open the floor for questions. Dr. Norwood, thank you so much. That was just wonderful. It was wonderful, informative, it was educational, and it was authentic. And it really hit home with a number of things that we can do as women, knowing that we are always doing a million things, but to be able to take time for ourselves, to be able to be partners with our healthcare professional so that we are doing what we can do to make sure that we have long life. Because I tell you, I'm going to live to 150. I'm telling you, I'm doing whatever I need to do. I just bought one of those Pelotons and I am so excited. Haven't got on it yet because I was sick, but I'm feeling better. So I'm going to really focus on doing that. Now we do have a question in the chat and for those individuals who want to put a question in the chat, please do, or you can open your mic, raise your hand. I'll call on you and have you talk. We have one question and one of the questions um, that are that's here that I see so far is, do you recommend a guide or website for how to properly conduct self breast exams? Mm. So um, there, there are multiple ways that uh, you can do the self breast exam. Uh, again, um, I, um, so there isn't a, a website that I can think of offhand, but let me tell you two quick techniques. One is called the, cl the clock technique, where you go around the breast counterclockwise, clockwise, and you go from the outer edge of the breast in towards the nipple. So if, uh, I'm not sure if you can see me, but I'm going to show you, again, starting from the outer portions of the breast. And when you're doing your breast exam, women, make sure that you go into the armpit because the armpit also has the tail of the breast and that's where lymph nodes are for breast cancer as well. So if there's something going on in the breast, the lymph nodes here in your armpit would also swell but you also have the tail of the breast. Breast tissue is in your axilla, in your armpit. So making sure that you go and examine in your armpit and going around the breast 
from the outer edge of the breast and work in, going again, in towards the nipple. And what would you say for men? Do men do the same thing? Because you share yes. some information and I know that um, one of the, the, the studies that you talked about uh, last month during um, Black History Month, you said that men survive longer when they have a partner or a female partner because they make sure that they get to the hospital. And we do have some men on this call as well. And you shared some information about um, um, breast cancer in men. How do they do the exam? The same. So again, the spokes of the, the uh, clockwise is one method and the other is like the spokes of a wheel. Um, and I see someone did give a website where you can actually do some, uh, get some additional information. But oh, the other Dr. is- also, Thank you, Dr. Harris. Thank you. And one is another one is like the spokes of a wheel where you can go from the outer edge into the nipple, like the spokes of a wheel. And sometimes you'll feel on um, physicians We'll do a combination of these different types of exams from the spokes of the wheel to the clockwise. But the most important part is to make sure that you're feeling deeply anything that you feel that feels different from one place to the other. And the woman who the woman and man who does their self breast exams are more likely to know when there is something that's different. So um, that's why I advocate for knowing what your breast tissue feels like. So when there's something different from the norm, you'll be aware of it. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for your um, vulnerability and your comfort with being able to show that, right? Because sometimes mm -hmm. people are shy and they don't want to show that. But we are here to talk about health. We are here to talk about prevention. And we are here to talk about long life. Because like I said, mm -hmm. I'm going to 150. And <laughs> and let me add one other thing with that breast exam, Dr. Sapp. Make sure that it, this is, again, armpit, important to make sure that you don't miss examining the breast tissue and to make sure you also check for skin dimpling, any changes with the skin. So sometimes you can look, if you're seeing a big dimple in the breast, that is not normal. So if you see changes in the skin, dimpling, and also do check for breast discharge. There should not be breast discharge unless you're lactating and breastfeeding. So if you're starting to get a breast discharge, bloody discharge, any discharge coming from your breast is a reason to also be examined. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. We just have some comments in the chat. One of my teachers said, everyone should meditate every day. And if you don't have time to meditate every day, you should meditate twice a day. It's so <laughs> important, especially when you are stressed. Wonderful, thank you for that tidbit. It's good. We have a few others, a lot of thank yous for the presentation, you know, a repeat of what you said, make sure that the agenda of others doesn't overtake the agenda that God has for you. Wise words, thank you so much, Dr. Norwood. This was a very informative presentation. We had some other comments mm -hmm. of sayings. Uh, I'm just checking through here to see if we have some other comments and also reminding people to sign up and register for the mug as well. The link is in there. People excited that they won mugs. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, a lot of thank yous, amazing presentation, empowering reminders. Any questions, anyone want to raise their hand and ask a question? Open up your mic. We have a, a small enough group at this point to open the mic and say something if they want to. And I want to just also add, um, I like that comment. If you don't have time to do uh, uh, med one minute meditation, that means you need to do you need to do at least two. So women, uh, women and men, let me simply say this: if you don't have time, one minute in your day to stop. Let me change that. You absolutely have one minute in your day to make sure that you stop and give yourself time to focus and to recenter because there's not going to be any stop of the other things coming to you. There won't be. 
if you don't learn to set boundaries, and that's the next piece out, Dr. Sapp, uh, when I have an opportunity to speak, I'm gonna talk about boundaries, um, which I think is really important for all of us in healthcare and all of us who try to do the thousand things that, um, that picture depicted, that if you're doing those things and they, they, add, they edify you and they add value to you and your family, I hear you. But if you don't take time, one minute to stop so you can breathe and remember who you are and to remember your name, you put yourself at risk. So not only are all of those things that I talked about important to do from the studies, the x-rays, the blah, if you don't stop to breathe, to remember who you are so that you can focus on not just what has happened, but your future and what it is that you wanna create as a creative being, you do yourself a disservice and all of those around you. So I want each of you as an action item from today's session, one, put in your calendar one minute a day where you will take the time to stop, recenter, and to breathe. If you're doing that in the bathroom while you're at work, that's fine. But someplace in your day, one minute minimum to stop and breathe and recenter. Number two, if you've not set up your exams for your physical exam, your mammogram, your colonoscopy if you're 45 and older, please make those appointments for those exams, your pap smear make those appointments so that you can get those done. If you not had your blood pressure checked, your blood sugar checked to make sure that you're not diabetic and not put a plan in place to help you to do regular exercise in the winter time, especially if you're in the Midwest, if you've not developed a plan so that you can have regular consistent exercise, if you live in Florida, you probably don't need a Peloton. But if you don't, if you live in Detroit, you need some form of exercise that's available for you year round. So you need to plan for it and make sure that you do it. So those are the things that I want you to do to make sure that you do as a part of an action plan from today's session. Thank mm -hmm. you, Dr. Sapp. Thank you. And you know, Dr. Nora, one of the things I have uh, two sisters and what we do is on March, Women History Month, we do all of that stuff together. So we are accountability partners to each other and we do that. We do our um, checks, our mammogram checks. We make our appointments in March. And so we can remind each other, did you make your appointment? Did you get your pap smear? Did you get your mammogram? Did you get your colonoscopy? So we do that for each other and we make sure we do it in March. We don't go to mm. sleep day, but our appointments are set in March every year. And we Love also it. take 10 minutes in the morning 10 minutes to just breathe in the bed. Soon as we get, before we get mm -hmm. out of the bed, we do 10 deep breathing exercises before we get up and start our day. Now my little niece, she's starting to do it. I want to do it. She's just turned 11 on Monday. And so now she does it. So we're teaching them how to start early and making sure you yes. take care of yourself. So we do that for each other, my two sisters and I. That we, mm -hmm. make, that we have this. And so we can do this, women. We can do this. It's so important. And I like the idea of starting early. You set the tone of your day by putting the agenda in place for you in the morning. So you have the agenda that's set as opposed to following someone else's agenda. So um, I likewise, I like to start early, do what I need to do for me early. First thing, first things first, you first and then schedule everything else that you need to do. Yes, yes, thank you so much. So now we're going to turn it over to Faith and she's going to close us out. My uh, computer doesn't seem to be working. I don't know why. Wonderful, thank you, thank you so again. much. <laughs> Go ahead, Faith. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. That was so amazing. Everybody in the comments is just like raving. I loved, I loved everything. It was so enlightening. Um, I just want to encourage everybody to register for our upcoming events tomorrow. 
we're going to have Ms. Kwanzaa Humphrey. Um, we're continuing with the Black Women's Health Matters series. Uh, she will be talking about reducing your stress by managing your money, how to get your finances in order. That's a really good one. So make sure you come in for that one. That's tomorrow, same time, noon to 1.15. And then we'll continue uh, again next week on Tuesday. Then we have another event Thursday and we'll keep it going through the rest of the month. So on the next slide, Dr. Sapp has a QR code. You can use your phone to scan uh, the code and then you can register for the rest of the event. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you again, Dr. Sapp and Dr. Norwood. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. And before everyone goes, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I have this meditation um, music that I listen to. We have about four minutes. I'm just going to put this on. If you want to stay and listen to this, please feel free to do that. I'm going to stop the recording and um, I'm just going to put this meditation music on.